and the amino acid cannot be a one-to-one. -one. In fact, it takes three nucleotides to code for only one amino acid. And so there are different combinations of three nucleotide coding for these different amino acids. And here we can see that the three nucleotide CUG, C C U A rather, is coding for the addition of a leucine, one of the amino acids in, in a protein. So here we have a scheme of what the cell looked like. There is a protein membrane in gray, and there are various uh, proteins being illustrated in different color. As you can see, some of those proteins are transmembrane. They go on both sides of the membrane. The stolfin in red is underneath the membrane, and it's connected with various other proteins. So everything that's going on in a cell is due to these proteins that form the cells and, and make all the function of the cell. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy, as many other hereditary disease, is due to mutation. Sometimes you may have only one nucleotide, which is changed, and this leads to a disease as severe as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Sometimes you may have a deletion of one or up to thousands of nucleotides, and other times you may have insertion of one nucleotide or thousands of nucleotides, and all these different mutations will lead to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And if they are in other genes than the, than the dystrophin gene, they will lead to other hereditary disease. We, we now think that there are over 7,000 different hereditary disease due to mutation in different genes. So this is what I have illustrated before. We can see the double-stranded DNA. And you can see on the left side that there is a pair of uh, nucleotide, which is uh, made of adenosine and thymine. And on the right side, we have a mutation where the this pair AT has been replaced by a pair CG, cytosine and guanine. So this is an example of a point mutation. Just one pair of nucleotide has been changed. And depending what pair of nucleotide is changes may lead to a severe hereditary disease. In, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, 70% 70, 70 of the mutation are deletion of one or more exons. I remember you that these uh, exons are sequences that are coding for the protein, but 30% of the mutation are small change of one or more nucleotide, but not a complete exon is changed. So uh, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy is an example of a recessive, res recessive mutation that is carried by women. The women have the mutation, the X chromosome, the dystrophin gene is on the X chromosome. So the, car the carrier of the disease have a mutation of one of their X chromosomes and they can transmit to their son either the mutated, uh, they, they will transfer to their son the mutated X or the normal mutated X chromosome. And if they transfer to their son, the mutated X chromosome, since the boys have only one X chromosome, they will manifest the disease. The boy that received the normal X chromosome from the mother and the, the Y chromosome from the father will not manifest the disease. But the girls may receive from their mother a mutated X chromosome and from their father a normal X chromosome. These girls will be carrier of the disease and they may eventually transmit the disease to their sons. Here we have an example of a mutation uh, where we had, for example, on the left side, we had a sequence which is CUA. This is a sequence in the messenger RNA coding for a leucine. And on the right side, we have changed only one nucleotide. And instead of incorporating in a protein a leucine, we are now incorporating in this protein a proline. It, it may be that this change will would change the conformation of the protein, change the function of that protein, and this may lead to an hereditary disease. Uh, this is a summary of the, what we call the genetic codes. It gives all the sequence of three nucleotides that codes for different amino acid. And as you can see overlighted in yellow, there are three different sequence which codes for a stop codon. And so that means that sometimes you will just change one letter and instead of coding for a 
amino acid, you will code for a stop codon and the synthesis of the protein will stop at that site. And so you will have an incomplete dystrophin protein the dystrophin protein will not be able to incorporate underneath the membrane of the muscle fiber. It will be absent, and this will lead to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So it's very really important to understand what are these stop codon, and they stop the protein. And here we have an example where we, we were waiting for the incorporation of a glutamine in the, in the, in the protein. But instead of that, there is one nucleotide that has been changed from a cytosine to a uridine and the UAA is a stop codon so the protein synthesis will stop at that site and, and the, therefore if this is happening in the dystrophin gene there will be an incomplete dystrophin protein that will not be able to play its role. Here we have a scheme of that dystrophin protein which is uh, underneath the membrane of the muscle fiber. The membrane is in uh, pale, pale white uh, and the dystrophin protein is in blue. And as you can see, there are numbers from one to 24. These are called spectrin-like repeat. There's a, a bit repetitive structure. And the dystrophin protein itself at the N terminal will be binding with actin. At the C terminal, it's binding with a lot of other protein, uh, which are called the dystrophin complex. And some of those protein are in the membrane and they will make link between the inside of the muscle fiber, the membrane and the outside of, of the muscle fiber. All of these other protein that make a complex with dystrophin have been shown to be mutated and to be responsible for other type of muscular dystrophy. This is a scheme of the dystrophin gene. As you can see here, the dystrophin genes contain 79 exons. And so the way this drawing is made is that each of these exons, number 11, for example, or number 12, each of these exons, in fact, is a sequence of uh, nucleotide. It's a DNA sequence, but instead of drawing all these DNA sequence to simplify the illustration, it's just little boxes which are numbered. So each one of these boxes is an exon. And, and as you can see, there are some exons that are terminating with a vertical bar. Uh, this means that the last codon, the last triplets of three nucleotide coding for an amino acid, it's complete. So sometime you will have the exon box ending with an pointed arrow, it means that uh, you have two of the three nucleotide in a coding for an amino acid, which is in that exon, but the third nucleotide to complete the, tr the set of three is in the following exon. And, and sometimes you have the reverse situation where you have a re reverse arrow. It means that there is only one nucleotide in, in, uh, in, for the triplet. It is important to understand this drawing because it explains why sometimes when there is one or two or three exons missing, the complete dystrophin protein or the, 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 the dystrophin protein will not be complete. For example, if you have a deletion of exon 50, you can notice that exon 50 starts with a vertical bar but ends with a reverse arrow. And that means that this exon 50 does not contain a multiple of three nucleotide. It's looking for another nucleotide in the exon 51 to complete a triplet coding for an amino acid. So when exon 50 is deleted, uh, it, the exon 49 sequence will be connected with exon 51 sequence. And this will not form the right sets of triplets. And this is called a frame shift. And what will happen is because of this frame shift, you will eventually meet a stop codon in exon 51. The synthesis of the protein will end at that site. And the dystrophin protein, you will have the beginning of the dystrophin protein, which is made. The end of the dystrophin protein is not made. It will not be able to incorporate itself underneath the muscle fiber membrane. And therefore, the muscle fiber membrane will be more vulnerable between 
during contraction, muscle fibers will break and this will lead eventually to the progressive muscle weakness. So uh, there are different pharmaceutical, pharmacological approaches that are being investigated uh, to, to help to treat the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, one of them is a Taluren. It's a drug that permits to bypass a stop codon. And it's a possible treatment for 10 to 15% of the patient. These are the patients that have a single nucleotide mutation. You know, just change one nucleotide you change one of the ATC, you change it by another letter, it creates a stop codon. And, and because of that, the synthesis of the protein will stop at that point. If you use this drug called Atalurin, it will permit to bypass this stop codon. Another amino acid will be incorporated. And then the other amino acid will be incorporated correctly. There are also other drugs which are being investigated. There are anti-inflammatory agents like tamoxifen, idebenon, bamorolone. Uh, there are also NF-kappa-B inhibitors and uh, antimyostatin, which is a drug that will permit the muscle to grow more uh, because myostatin is a component, it's a protein that normally limits the growth of muscle fiber. So as mentioned by before, uh, my group has been working on a potential treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, uh, which is myoblast transplantation. In fact, the idea of that treatment is to obtain a muscle biopsy from a healthy donor, either the father or the mother of the patient. And when we obtain a muscle biopsy, there is, of course, muscle fibers, but there are mononucleated cells, just very small cells, which are close to these muscle fiber, which are called satellite cells. And these satellite cells, when they proliferate, they will become myoblasts. And we can put these satellite cells in culture. And within three weeks, we can obtain millions of uh, myoblasts. And these myoblasts, since they are coming from a healthy person, they contain a nucleus, which contain a normal dystrophin gene. And so therefore, when we transplant these myoblasts into the muscle, of a Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient, they will introduce, these myoblasts will fuse with the existing muscle fiber of the patient. They will introduce a nucleus which contain normal dystrophin gene, and this will lead to the expression of dystrophin in the muscle fibers of the patient. And as you can see at the bottom left, uh, these are, this is a cross section of a Duchenne patient that received myoblast transplantation. And one month later, we took a muscle biopsy and there were 26% of the muscle fiber expressing this dystrophin. The, the beauty of this type of approach is myoblast transplantation can work for whatever mutation there is in the patient genome. You may have uh, simply a point mutation somewhere among the 79 exons or you may have a deletion of one or several exons. And since we are transplanting normal cells containing the normal dystrophin gene, this will always restore the expression of dystrophin. And so therefore we are currently trying to conduct a phase one, two clinical trial in collaboration with Dr. Craig Campbell in London and Dr. Jack Pumira in Quebec. But unfortunately this clinical trial is currently halted by the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, this is a slide that illustrates uh, what's happening when there is a deletion. I mentioned it before. We, we have a healthy subject on the top where every exon is present, and we have on the right side the presence of the dystrophin protein in red. But at the bottom, we have an example of a Duchenne patient which has a deletion of exon 50, and because exon 50 does not contain a multiple of three nucleotide, when it is deleted, it leads to a frame shift. That is, we will not have the same sets of three nucleotide, and a stop codon will be met in exon 51. And therefore, as you can see on the right side, there is an absence of that dystrophin protein, and the muscle fibers are replaced by fat and connective tissue.
So this is, a, again, an example of a deletion of, uh, uh, in this case, this is a deletion of exon 50, exon 49 being connected directly with exon 51. And again, there is a frame shift and there will be the absence of this token. Here we have an example of what's happening in the case of Becker muscular dystrophy. Becker muscular dystrophy patient, they also have mutation in the dystrophin gene. But in their case, they have a deletion of one or several exons, but their deletion is such that it doesn't change the reading frame. For example, here we have a patient that has a deletion of exon 74. Exon 73 is connected directly with exon 75, but there is no frame shift, and therefore the, the, the dystrophin protein will continue to be made this dystrophin protein will miss a small part code, in fact, by exon 474, but it will have the beginning of the protein, the end of the protein, and it will be able to be underneath the muscle fiber membrane and play partially the role of the normal dystrophin. So depending on it, in the Becker patient, what are the exons which are deleted and what part of the protein these exons are coding for, you will have a more or less severe uh, form of dystrophy. See, here we have again this patient that has a deletion of exon 50. And one of the therapy which is being as pursued by a lot of a group is to do exon skipping. Exon skipping use a sequence of nucleotide that is complementary to the beginning of the exons that we want to skip. So in this slide, we have, for example, a deletion of exon 50, and we will use a sequence of nucleotide that will be complementary to the beginning of exon 51. This will permit to eliminate exon 51 when forming the, uh, the final message RNA coding for the dystrophin protein. And therefore, in this situation, you will have exon 49 being connected directly with exon 52. As you can see, the two exons are, one is ending with a vertical bar, the other one is starting with a vertical bar. That means that exon 49 contains a complete set of three nucleotides for the last codon. And exon 52 is starting with a com complete set of three nucleotides for coding for one amino acid. So that means there is no frame shift, there is just a part of the protein, the dystrophin protein, which is missing, the part coded by exon 50 and by exon 51 is missing, but you have nevertheless a dystrophin protein that will be made. It will have the beginning of the protein, the end of the protein, and it will be able to play a more or less function depending on which part of the protein is missing. But the skipping of exon 51 is a, something which is being pursued by many groups because it's a solution whether you are missing exon 50 or missing exon 49 and 50, or if you are missing exon 48, 49 and 50, this will still be a solution. And if you're missing 47, 48, 49, 50, skipping of exon 51 will again restore the normal reading frame and permit the expression of a dystrophin protein where there is an internal part missing, but this protein will be more or less functional. So this is the type of therapy which is de developed by a uh, different company. We have Serepta company, for example, which is, has developed a drug to skip exon 51, and they have developed another drug to skip exon 53. Uh, th this is one of the problem of exon skipping is that it is different reagents that have to be used to skip different exons, and so it's not a solution for every deletion in the uh, Duchenne patient, different drugs have to be developed to skip different exons to restore the normal reading frame in the Duchenne patient, depending on which exons are missing. So uh, the, the problem with exon skipping is also that th this is a drug that is acting on the messenger RNA rather than asking on the code of the of DNA, which is in the nucleus. 
this drug is acting on the messenger RNA, which is now in the cytoplasm. It is modifying the messenger RNA, but messenger RNA are being made all the time. They're being made as copies of the DNA transported in the cytoplasm to code for the protein. So this drug that permit exon skipping has to be uh, given all the time to the patient. So this is not a definitive cure. The patient have to use this drug all the time for the rest of their life and the annual cost of these drugs is unfortunately uh, very, uh, very high. And, and it is believed that exon skipping is a solution for about 30% of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient. For, for some patients that have a point mutation, depending where the point mutation is located, exon skipping is, is not a solution. So, uh, one of the solutions on which uh, different research groups are working is to deliver a microdystrophin gene by an adeno-associated virus. This is the treatment I'm going to mention now. Adeno-associated virus are, you know, one of those many viruses that uh, very often virus cause disease, but this adeno-associated virus fortunately does not cause disease. And when it is used for gene therapy, the DNA which is inside of the virus is uh, replaced by the DNA sequence that we want to introduce a normal gene. So one of the problem of the adeno-associated virus, called AAV, is that it can contains only 4,800 nucleotides. The dystrophin gene is uh, two times, three, almost three times bigger than that. And so the full dystrophin gene cannot be inserted into an AAV. And this is why uh, researchers have been trying to produce a micro dystrophin gene. Uh, these adeno-associated virus are produced in bioreactor. We can see examples of those bioreactor here. And the production of these AAV is extremely expensive. Uh, last year, I have inquired about uh, making a clinical trial using AAV. And just for the production of the AAV for one patient, the cost was about $600,000 just for the production of the AAV. It's not uh, including all the other costs of doing the clinical trial. So this is why any treatment that would be based on the delivery of a micro dystrophin gene uh, is going to be uh, very expensive, uh, uh, at least $1 million, perhaps more. So this type of, of gene therapy that is providing a normal gene or smaller gene to compensate for a mutated gene, it's, this is called gene therapy. And it's a possible type of treatment for many hereditary disease. And researchers have been working on such an approach for uh, the last 30 years. And, but, but the good news is that uh, there are now success of gene therapy for several hereditary disease. And this is uh, growing expense, uh, rapidly. Uh, one of the disease, for example, for which there is a cure now, it's, it's an amino, it's an immunodeficiency. It's boys that were living in a bubble because their immune system was defective. They could not fight any infection. And using gene therapy, they have been successful at introducing in the cells of these patients, in the hematopoietic stem cells, they have been successful at introducing the normal gene, which was mutated in this patient. And because of that, the patient are no longer uh, in isolation, they can fight disease and they are living a normal way. Uh, there is also a, a blindness disease called Leber congenital amaurosis. This is a, a, a disease where the people are blind because there is only one gene which is, which is defective. It's a gene that codes for a protein which is in the retina of the eye. And because of that, the, these persons are not able to to de detect the light, and, and they are blind. And, and so this treatment is now possible by injecting an AAV coding for the right protein, 
which will be produced in the retina and the people are be seeing, you know, I've been in, in one of the first American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy where this was presented and, you know, I was quite astonished by this success, you know, you have a blind person which after the treatment is seeing. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the problem with the adeno-associated virus is they can contain only 4,800 nucleotide. The dystrophin gene itself, if we use only the part that codes for the protein, it's still 11,055 nucleotide. So that's why people are trying to make a macro dystrophin. But so to make a macro dystrophin, that means that you have to remove part of the sequence coding for dystrophin. And the big question is which part should be removed. So uh, this concept of making a mini dystrophin or a macro dystrophin initially was thought about in 1990. This was because they observed that a Becker patient that had more than 50% of the dystrophin gene missing had been walking with a cane until the age of 65. So they realized that it's not necessary to have the complete dystrophin gene. We can remove some part and, and still have something functional. So uh, different research group have been working on that for many years. And it's uh, uh, in 2018 that uh, systemic injection of AAV coding for microdystrophin have been done for the first time. Oops. So now there are currently uh, three different clinical trials which are being done. Uh, and the idea of these different clinical trials is different part of the dystrophin gene have been removed. And we can see here different variation of this uh, dystrophin gene. You can see that sometimes you have R2 to R21, which are missing. And other time you have R2 is still there. And so you, you have different combination of deletion of the dystrophin gene, which are being investigated by different researchers. And as I mentioned, there's currently three clinical trials which are being conducted, one by the Pfizer company, one by Serepta Therapeutics, and another one by Solid Bioscience. And what's different between these three clinical trials is that they are using uh, different AAVs. You know, there's sometimes uh, the AAVs also may infect more or well different type of cells. So they have using different version uh, of the AAV, and especially they are using different version of the micro dystrophin gene. And so these clinical trial, their aim is to see if the introduction of a micro dystrophin gene will permit to increase the strength of the patient. So preliminary results have been published by Dr. Mendel and by Serapta and uh, the, the preliminary results are encouraging. Microdystrophin is detected in the muscle fibers of the patient that have been treated. The creatine kinase, which is an enzyme released by the muscle fibers when they are damaged, the creatine kinase in the uh, serum of the patient is reduced, indicating that there are fewer muscle fibers which are being damaged by exercise. And, and so far they have not observed any severe adverse effects during these treatment. And so therefore the results are encouraging and these clinical trials are ongoing. The fourth type of treatment that I would like to present to you, it's the genetic modification of the dystrophin gene by a new technology called CRISPR therapeutics. This new technology called clustered regulatory interspace short polydynamic repeat, in short CRISPR, it is a system that come from bacteria. Bacteria have been using that for millions of years to fight phage, which are a type of virus that infect the bacteria. Bacteria have been using that. And in 2012, scientists have realized that this system that permits to cut DNA at precise site uh, might be used to uh, to modify genes in the human system. And this is what is illustrated here. 
this system use a protein called Cas9. The Cas9 is a protein that is able to cut DNA and this Cas9 is working in combination with the guide RNA and the guide RNA has a sequence of 20 nucleotide which is complementary to the sequence of DNA where we want to make a cut. And so with this system, it is possible to induce cuts in the DNA, although the human DNA contains 3.2 billion nucleotide, it is possible to make a cut in the DNA at, at the place where we want it, among these 3.2 3 billion nucleotides. So th this is a fantastic technology. And when this first appeared in 2012, you know, it was fantastic new break and, uh, and there has been hundreds of, of articles that have been written on the CRISPR system. It's being used to modify genes in animals, in, in, uh, so far in human cells and, and in plants. So uh, Dr. Olson in the States is using the CRISPR technology as a modified way of trying to remove the complete exons. Remember before we had here a patient that has a deletion of exon 50, it was possible to skip exon 51 by using oligonucleotide, which were modifying the messenger RNA. And as I mentioned, when you are using oligonucleotide, these oligonucleotide have to be used all the time by the patient. Each year you have to pay for these medication. Whereas what Dr. Olson is working on is using the CRISPR technology to modify the beginning of exon 51 so that exon 51 is eliminated when making the messenger RNA. And you now have connecting exon 49 with exon 52. You are restoring the normal reading frame. But the beauty of this approach is the modification is made in the DNA, not in the messenger RNA. And so the treatment has to be applied only once. And then for the rest of its life, the gene is corrected and the patient will be able to make uh, this trophy. So this is ongoing research in animal model. Unfortunately, this type of treatment using CRISPR has not yet reached the patient, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient in clinical trial, but th this is ongoing and this is promising. So my group has also been using this type of approach to modify the dystrophin gene. And we are aiming not only at cutting the dystrophin gene and restoring the normal uh, reading frame of the dystrophin gene, but we are also paying attention to create a dystrophin protein that has a normal shape. And so we, we are trying to do what is illustrated at the bottom of this slide here. Normally, I mentioned there are uh, 24 spectrin-like repeats. And each of these spectrin-like repeats is made of three helix, A, B, and C. And so we want to restore a dystrophin protein which has a normal spectrin-like repeat. It has a succession of A, B, and C. Uh, illustrated in the middle of this slide is a situation where you don't have this normal succession of A, B, and C. You have a C connected with a B, and this changed the conformation of a protein and we believe that the protein, the dystrophin protein, will not be working as well when its shape is not normal. And so our, our approach is a, a bit different to, to the one that uh, Dr. Olson is conducting. And again, this is uh, research which is being conducted in cells of patients, in animal model, but has not yet reached clinical tests in patients. Here is an example of what uh, we have been doing in my laboratory. Instead of uh, trying to uh, delete one or two exons using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, we are cutting in two exons. We have here an example, for example, of a patient that has a deletion of exon 52, but we have decided to cut in exon 47 and cut in exon 58 to create an hybrid exon 47-58. The beauty of this approach is this is a solution for any mutation between exon 47 and 58. Maybe a deletion of exon 49, 40, 50, or exon 50 and 51, or any point mutation between 
these exon 47 and 58, this is a solution for all of these patients because we are creating exon 4758, which is called for a dystrophin protein that has a normal structure and normal form and should work very well. So we, we have already done this type of experiment in, in a mouse model, which has a human dystrophin gene and has a deletion of exon 52. And we have been able to restore the expression of dystrophin in this mouse model. This is an example of this mouse model. You can see that we have injected intravenously in the mouse the adeno-associated virus coding for this, this CRISPR, this Cas9, and, and to guide RNA, we have injected that in the blood of the mouse. And one month later, we have connected the, the muscle of different, the diaphragm, the decastronemius, the quadriceps, the abdominal muscle and the heart. And you can see that in all of these muscles, we have been able to restore the expression of the dystrophin protein. So this is a very encouraging approach that again has not unfortunately reached clinical trial. And what is fantastic in science is that this is progressing very, very, very rapidly. This CRISPR technology, which was discovered in 2012, has now evolved to this point that in 2018, a modification of that CRISPR technology made it possible to change only one nucleotide in the human genome. I remember you remind you the human genomes contain 3.2 billion nucleotides. And this new technology permits to, to change one of these nucleotides at will. Uh, so this is, this is fantastic. And so, for example, here we had a, a situation where we, we had a set of three uh, uh, nu nucleotide CUA coding for a leucine. And if you change it for C, you will have a proline. So you, you have changed, you have one mutation that has changed one amino acid. So using that technology, it is possible to modify it. For example, in this case, we, we had a, a mutation Normally, we have a sequence which is CAA coding for gluten, glutamine, and, and uh, the mutation has made has changed a C for U, and you have a stop coda. But using that technology, it's possible to correct that, that point mutation. And, and again, the, that technology, that CRISPR technology, is evolving every year. In, in October 2019, a, again, a, a new version of that technology now permits to correct uh, several nucleotides. Uh, again, either introducing new nucleotide, deleting some nucleotide, or changing some nucleotide. All of those three things are possible by a, an article that was published in Nature 2019. And, and rapidly, uh, my group has started to work on that uh, uh, technology and, and fortunately we have been uh, our research project has been funded by Jesse's journey and this is one research project which is ongoing in my laboratory this is an example here of how we we have one point mutation we had a CG pair which is changed uh, there's a point mutation is changed by TA pair this is the only modification in the genome of this patient but the uh, technology, the prime editing technology, which is the name of that new modification, uh, permits to reverse the, this mutation. So th this is what we are hoping to be able to do uh, for the patient in Canada that have point mutation, a change of one pair of nucleotide only. We hope that we can adopt this prime editing technology to correct that point mutation. So in Canada, there are 29 point mutation observed in Canadian patients, uh, and our aim is to be able to correct all these 29 mutation observed in Canadian patients. So the, the beauty of that new technology is that 
many of these 7,000 hereditary diseases that I have mentioned are, are due to point mutation. You know, just one nucleotide has been, one nucleotide pair has been changed somewhere in the human genome, and this is responsible for an hereditary disease. This new technology permits, in principle, to correct each of these point mutations. So one, this technology will be working for one hereditary disease. We can hopefully apply the same type of correction to these other 7,000 hereditary disease. And as you can see, I still have work for a few years. So thank you very much for paying attention to my conference and I'm now ready to answer your questions. Dr. Trombley, uh, thank you so much. Uh, what a wonderful presentation a thorough update on the progress uh, of the, the Duchenne research and treatments that are going on. Uh, I'm sure that was most informative and appreciated by the families. Uh, we, can't, we can't thank you enough. Uh, please stay with us. I know we're running over time, but I think that what uh, Dr. Trombley had to say was critical and, and, and thank you again for covering so many different areas in the treatments that are are underway out there and uh, hopefully going to come to Canada, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, we want to invite questions now, as Dr. Trombley said, while well, we still have them on the line. So please stay with us, folks. We're going to run a bit over time in order to accommodate that. But we'll ask everyone if they, if they could put them in the chat, and then we will uh, answer the questions as they come uh, in, in either English or in French. It doesn't matter. So please feel free now to submit those questions in the chat. And uh, we will have Rochelle deal with the English version, and Mary Catherine will deal with the uh, the French questions. So, Dr. Tremblay, uh, there should be some coming coming to you soon. All right. So we do have one question here from Vincent, uh, Dr. Tremblay. He asks, "Is the cost of CRISPR affordable?" The, the, for this technique, unfortunately, it's the, the same problem. Gene therapy, the main problem is always been delivery, delivery, delivery. And so using the CRISPR technology, we have to deliver to the cells of the patient, the gene coding for Cas9 and the sequence coding for the guide RNA. And again, at this point, the best delivery system is the adeno-associated virus. But fortunately, my laboratory is also working on a new delivery method, which I'll call uh, extracellular vesicle. Extracellular vesicles are very, very small circles, particles, which are produced by every cell in the body. They are extremely abundant in the human plasma. There are 10 to the 15, power 15, that means 10s followed by 15, zero. They are that abundant in a one liter of human plasma. And we are working on trying to use these small extracellular vesicles to deliver genes and deliver protein uh, as a new way of, of developing gene therapy. So th this is still in early experiments. I can tell you that we are able to deliver genes and protein in cells and culture, and we are barely starting trying to do that in animal. But I hope that in the future, this could really reduce the price of gene therapy. Great, thank you so much. We have another question here. It says, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, very informative. Most of the treatment options you mentioned are for later mutations, for example, 15 onwards. What about the missing 21 to 22 exon? Are there any options? Yeah, there, there are, uh, it is always new option. For example, if these mutations are just point mutation in between one and 21, we can just correct that point mutation. There is also a new variant of the CRISPR technology, which is called a, a a transposase. It's a, it's a new technique that will permit to introduce sequence of nucleotide, large sequence of nucleotide, as much as 10,000 nucleotide could be introduced at a very pre precise site in the human genome. With the, this is combination of a, of, a, of a technique called transposon, it's, a, it's an enzyme called transposase that works in combination with Cas9 and you have again a guide RNA that will indicate exactly where you want that to be incorporated. These are new articles, you know, less than one year old. Uh, there was a recent meeting of the American Society for Cell and Gene Therapy, and, and uh, there were a few conferences on that technology, but I think it's very promising that indeed 
when there are fragments of a gene missing, we could introduce that fragment of gene missing. Okay, great. And I think a very similar question here, and you might have just answered it through, through that answer, but are research studies being carried out on multi-exon deletions in other regions, such as exon 6 to 16? Again, uh, there is no uh, precise project that I know at this point, which are working on introducing precisely these exons, but there are, as I mentioned, new technology that will eventually permit to introduce large sequence of DNA. And, and whenever this is working to introduce one sequence of DNA, it would be useful to introduce any sequence of DNA. But for each of these approach, we need a research team working on that. But the, the future is promising. You know, I, I always say to, to people that I, I, I'm doing now things that I thought impossible five years ago. <laughs> That's, that's very hopeful news, Dr. Tremblay. We have a question here from Rachel. Do you have any idea when human clinical trials may happen for CRISPR technology? Uh, there are several American groups that are working on, on doing that. Uh, the initial, well, one of the good news is Dr. Holson has raised a lot of money for, for his research. He's, he has formed a company that has uh, raised $125 million uh, and so this is a company that they wants to develop that technology. And uh, hopefully with this kind of money, you will be able to push all the way to a clinical trial. And, and, and hopefully it, it, the clinical trial will be successful. Uh, but right now, the, the company, there are different groups working on trying to use the CRISPR technology to modify genes and correct genes in cells and culture and then putting them back to the patient greater than mm -hmm. correcting cells directly in, in the patient. Because one, one of the problem, although I emphasize that the CRISPR-Cas9 technology can cut the DNA at a precise location, it happens sometimes that they will be cut at other sites. And this is the, the, the worry right now and why it's slowing down the application in humans. We want to make sure that by correcting a, a gene we are not mutating some other genes and mutating genes, for example, that might induce a cancer. So th this is why right now, the initial clinical trial of the CRISPR-Cas9 technology will probably be on cells of patients that are corrected in culture and then put back in the patient. And, and this is especially easy for the cells of the immune system because the hematopoietic stem cells can be corrected put them back in a patient and you may correct the uh, irritative disease of the immune system. And, and this type of correction of cells outside the body of the patient, this is something that could eventually be done for myoblasts. We could correct the myoblasts of a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, correct the dystrophin gene and insert them back in, in the same patient. This is one thing that we are thinking about, but uh, again, <laughs> With a small team, it's difficult to do everything. But, the, 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 you know, right now, the sky is the limit. I think it's fantastic what can, in principle, be done. We have work to do for, for many years, and uh, uh, let's hope success for many of the following years. Fantastic. Thank you. And I know that we do have some French questions on the line, and we were, are running a little bit over time. Um, so, Marie Catherine, do you mind asking some of the, the questions in French? And Dr. Tremblay, if you don't mind responding in French, and those that would like to listen to the question in English and the response in English, just make sure that you, uh, you change your interpretation tool uh, accordingly. So, Marie Catherine, do you mind asking a few of those? Oui, bonjour, Monsieur Tremblay. Alors, j'ai une question ici uh, de Anne-Marie. Qui est, um, est-ce que le saut d'exon, en parenthèse, on parle de Vion 253, est plus efficace que uh, de prendre des corticostéroïdes? Serait plus efficace que de prendre des corticostéroïdes? Uh, je, je pense que oui, si, ça, si on peut démontrer qu'on rétablit le cadre de lecture du, du gène de la dystrophine, on a l'expression d'une dystrophine qui va être uh, fonctionnelle et, et je pense que c'est un meilleur approche d'utiliser simplement des corticostéroïdes qui ne font que ralentir la progression de la maladie. Si on peut rétablir l'expression de la dystrophine, on devrait vraiment arrêter ou fortement ralentir la progression de la maladie. Donc, ce sera certainement une meilleure approche. 
Merci. J'ai une autre question ici euh, de Véronique. On me dit, pour une personne atteinte de la dystrophie de de chaîne, ayant 15 ou 20 ans, en âge plus avancé, euh, pourrait-il recevoir ce traitement et permettre l'amélioration de ses capacités physiques? J'imagine euh, tous les nouveaux traitements là, de... que vous avez parlé dans votre compte. Le, le, le... Les différentes approches de thérapie génique ont pour but de corriger le gène de la dystrophine pour que les, les fibres musculaires résistent mieux durant les contractions musculaires. Malheureusement, pour les patients qui sont plus avancés dans leur maladie, les fibres musculaires ont été remplacées par du gras et du tissu conjonctif. Et la seule approche thérapeutique qui peut aider dans ce cas-là, ce serait d'être capable de produire des nouvelles fibres musculaires. Et c'est pour ça que mon équipe continue de travailler sur la greffe des myoblastes, parce que les myoblastes sont des cellules qui forment des fibres musculaires. Et on espère qu'éventuellement, on pourrait, avec la greffe des myoblastes, non seulement introduire le gène normal de la dystrophine dans les fibres musculaires existantes, mais peut-être former de nouvelles fibres musculaires qui pourraient, elles, augmenter la force des muscles. Et, et, mais c'est encore des, des, des projets de recherche à, à long terme. Merci. Une dernière question que j'ai dans la liste ici en français, euh, qui me vient de Colette. Est-ce qu'une duplication d'exon est traitée euh, de façon similaire à un saut d'exon? Mm. Ouais. De façon similaire à un saut, il est marqué délétion, j'imagine. Est-ce qu'ils sont traités différemment quand c'est duplication, j'imagine, ou quand il en manque? Oui, en fait, il y, a, il y a différents trucs qui peuvent être utilisés pour, en effet, enlever l'exon qui qui, lorsqu'on a une duplication. Des fois, il faut couper à l'intérieur de... Mettons que c'est une duplication de l'exon 22. On coupe à l'intérieur de l'exon 22, mais comme il y a deux exons 22, on va se trouver à couper à deux endroits. Et ça va permettre d'enlever la, la fin d'un exon 22 et le début de l'autre exon 22. Et ça va reformer un exon 22 normal, complet. Donc, on a enlevé la fin d'un exon 22 et le début de l'autre exon 22 et on rétablit comme ça un exon 22 normal. Et oui, il y a des groupes qui travaillent sur ce genre d'approche-là, mais en, en principe, il y a des solutions pour les duplications d'exon. De de, Merci. Je pense que... Euh, euh, Rachel, euh, il y avait une autre question en anglais à la suite. Yes, we are running a little bit over time, so and we do have a few more questions. Uh, what we'll do is the questions we did not get to, we will take those and uh, send them to Dr. Tremblay if you don't mind answering after today's webinar. And uh, we'll send those responses to all the attendees after today. So I will turn it uh, back over to Rick to close us out from today's event. Thank you, Rochelle. And uh, Dr. Tremblay, thank you so much again. And as Rochelle said, the questions we'll get, we, that we were unable to get to today, we will, we will make sure we get an answer to. We'll put Dr. Tremblay on the spot to get those answered as well. <laughs> Who better? It'll be my pleasure to answer those questions. Thank you so much. I knew, I knew that would be your answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Tremblay. And so, um, yes, just a, a couple of reminders to wrap up here and a few things we'd like to say. First of all, a huge thank you to Dr. Tremblay. Uh, thank you so much for making time for us today and uh, in such an informative presentation. To uh, Mary Catherine from uh, La Force, uh, merci beaucoup. To all of our sponsors, uh, to you for joining us, the families across Canada and beyond uh, for joining us today. And I also want to thank Rochelle behind the scenes for pulling all this together and making pictures happen when they're supposed to and slides go when they're supposed to and all that other stuff. It's way beyond my skill set, I'll tell you. Um, the only thing you could not control was the presenter who went overboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I don't think anybody minded uh, this running a little long based on the information that was there. But we do look forward to seeing you at our next virtual event, and that's going to be on Saturday, this Saturday, from 10 to 11.30. We'll hear from Dr. Jose La Rochelle and uh, Anne-Sophie Saint-Pierre-Clement on the transition to adult care. We'll also be joined by Dr. Frank Rausch on Duchenne and Bone Health. Uh, we'll be sending out email reminders and to the Zoom and the Zoom links on Friday, so look for those. And finally, it's only through the support of donors, families, and communities across Canada and around the world that Jesse's journey can continue to fund the most promising research into Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it's only through the advancement of research, as we heard this afternoon, that the thousands of children who face Duchenne can have hope and long life and be inspired to live their lives to the fullest. 
we hope I would like to add that yes. my clinical trial of myoblast transplantation and my research on prime editing are two projects that are supported by Jesse's journey, and thank you. And it was our pleasure, Doctor. We hope you'll get involved, whether it be helping to raise funds through your local community, sharing your story to raise awareness, becoming an advocacy ambassador, volunteering, or simply joining the conversations on social media. We wish you all a wonderful rest of the day and we'll see you on Saturday. Thank you all. Good afternoon.